I, I prayed right there, and I said, consecrate. Consecrate. It's a, it's a word that is in Scripture. In Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7. The, the Lord says, consecrate yourselves. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. For I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Jehovah Makedesh. Jehovah Makedesh. The Lord who sanctifies you. Now we've been in this series called The Names of God. And it's been good. Like, I've, I've been getting a lot of feedback from you guys. Last week was like just straight spit truth, like a lot of biblical words, and, you, and it, it resonated. Like, I think there's a pressure today for pastors to be cool and hip and relatable and use illustrations, and I think all of that has a time and a place, but, but how many of you know the Word of God just spits truth? Right to what you need. And so last week, I mean, if you've missed any of these, I would encourage you to go back. Because today, we see that God is Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord who sanctifies. What does that mean, sanctification? I think we got to understand that. Now listen, there's going to be a lot of teaching, and there's going to be some preaching mixed in too. So I need you to make sure your friend and your spouse are not distracted. They're good to go. Lean in, because I really believe this word is going to change people. God says, he is the Lord who sanctifies. What does that mean? Sanctification means to be set apart as special. To be set apart, to be made separate, to be made holy. Holy, holy. God says, I am the one who makes you holy. I am the one who sets you apart. You think you're this person, you see yourself as this way, but I am God and I am the one who takes you and makes you special. Sets you out here and makes you different, makes you holy. Now how? How does God make you holy? Because if I asked you right now, how many of you feel holy today? How many of you feel special and set apart by God? I don't think many hands go up. Because we instantly think about what we did or what we've done or what we're doing. We don't see ourselves as holy. And praise God that he doesn't see us as we see ourselves. 1 Corinthians 130 says, and because of him, who? Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification. There's that word, and redemption. God sanctifies you. God chooses you, adopts you, takes you, and sets you apart from everyone else and makes you holy. How? Remember last week we talked about it. How do you become right with God? It is only by the blood of Jesus that you are righteousness. If you are trying to be right to God, to, with God today, if you are sitting here because you feel guilty and you know what you've done and you can't see life is falling apart and you think this is going to make you better and make you right with God, you are lying to yourself. You are fooled. It is only the blood of Jesus having faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that makes you right, that sets you apart as holy. Let me just say it this way. You don't change behaviors so your heart will change. Your behavior changes because your heart has changed. Just leave that one up there and just soak that in because many people today are trying to get to God, are trying to please God, and so you tithe. You serve, you come to church, you pray, you don't do this, and you don't do this, and there's no way you're going here, and, and all with the hopes of being right with God. But the problem is, if your heart's not right, then all this behavior modification does is leave you tired. 
Some of you are in this place tired, exhausted today. You're tired because nothing you're doing is working. And it's a heart that needs to be changed. All other religions say, do, do, work, work. And the gospel says, done. It is finished. And when you lean into that, rest into that, put your faith and hope in Jesus Christ, his finished work, that's when your heart changes. That's how the Lord is Jehovah Makedesh. Nothing you can do. That's called positional sanctification. So when you give your life to Christ and when you, when you truly repent and turn to him, you are set apart in heaven forever. Forever, sealed, signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours, right? Like that's, that's what happens. Well, what happens if I sin? No, 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 it's paid for. Well, yeah, yeah, but what if, what, Chris, what if I really sin? No, 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 that's paid for too. There's no really sin, it's just sin. It's paid for. But if your heart's right, you're not going after that sin. You're not going back to that sin. That is positional sanctification. So if you're saved today, you have been sanctified, set apart, special, chosen, and holy by God. The problem is this. For all my saved people who aren't living saved. You are not being sanctified on earth. Oh, you got positional sanctification, but you don't look like God now, do you? This is the problem with Christians. This is our problem. We don't look like Christians. We don't. Here's the way Paul says it. Ephesians 5, and this is where we're going to be. Verse 5. Therefore, church... Be imitators of God as beloved children. Be imitators of God as beloved children. We must be imitators of God. Can I just get up in your business? Who you imitating? Who you want to be like? Like back in the day, it was like, be like Mike. That was the slogan. Be like Michael Jordan. Everybody wanted to be like Mike. Who you want to be like today? What's the influencer right now that, you, that came to your mind? For many people, when they're kids, they want to be like who? Mom, dad, right? Kids will imitate you. They'll talk like you. They'll dress like you. They'll do mannerisms. And then something happens. They hit puberty, and they want nothing to do with you, right? And so, like, who do you want to be like right now? Who are you idolizing Go to your social media, open it up. Who do you have to see all the time? And who, what story really matters to you? Who are you imitating? Who do you have to dress like? Who do you have to follow? What do you have to say? If you are saved, you are called to imitate one, the one, the great I am. We're called to imitate God. And notice that verse in verse 5. We don't imitate God to become his children. We imitate God because we are his children. Look. I know that, man, I know. And I can, I can say this. I don't know what you've been through. But I got my own daddy issues. And I know some of you didn't have a great father. And I know some of you were neglected and abused and verbally abused, physically abused. And I know when I say father or dad, it just sends that chill down your body. I want to tell you, you have a good, good father who sanctifies you. He saved you. He set you apart. And I know dad didn't make you feel special, but he has set you apart to be special, to be holy. And he's my father, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever I can to look like him, to act like him, to think like him and talk like him. What does that look like? 
okay? If we get this right, Christians, I'm not talking to the unbelievers. If you're doubting your salvation, you're listening, you're listening. But this message primarily is for the children of God. What does it look like to imitate God? Paul tells us. See, I don't have to make this up. I don't have to give you my opinion. The word of God speaks truth. In verse 2, it says what? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If I'm going to imitate God, here's the first thing I got to do. Probably the most important thing I got to do is love like Jesus. I have to love like Jesus. How are you doing at this? Just think about the people in your life. Think about your workplace. Think about every, how are you doing loving like Jesus? Because Paul says to walk in love as Christ loved us. How has Christ loved us? He gave himself up for us. Jesus says in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Can I ask you, how many of us are sacrificing for people. I'm not talking about the slaughtering of animals. I'm talking about with your time, with your money, with your words, with your resources. How are you doing at loving by sacrificing? Because love is sacrificial. Too long. I spent using and abusing people to get what I want. If you could help me out, I would draw close. That is not love. Oh, I'd, I'd hang with you. We'd have a good time. But if you could help me get to where I wanted to be, that's the reason you were in my life. How are you doing sacrificing? I mean, parents, you know how to sacrifice. You sacrifice everything for kids. So that's, that's kind of easy because you love your kids. Maybe it's easy in your marriage. Maybe it's not. Does your spouse come first? Like, man, you got one responsibility. One. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. What did he do? It just says. Gave his life. For the church. So you give everything for your wife. She comes first. Sometimes you do things. Wait, a lot of times you do things you don't want to do. Why? Because you love her. You don't do it. You don't do it with the wrong motive, the wrong attitude. You don't do it in return to get something. Hello. You just sacrifice because you love. And it's easy to do with the ones who love you. How, how are you, like, this is the first way to look like God. If I ask you today, describe the world, in, or describe America, or describe your community, or your job, in, in one word, would it be love? Nope, it would be selfish. Selfish. How you doing loving people? And how you doing loving people nobody wants to love? Because that's who Jesus went after. We got new members, Chris and Kim, and their little boy Mason. There was a man that they found in their yard, backyard, woods. Found him, living, but he was homeless. Mason's heart broke. The little boy. His heart broke for the man. Daddy, can we let him stay in the treehouse? Now, see, you got the wrong picture already. Because the treehouse tree house has power. It has heat. It has air conditioning. It's got TV. Like, it's the bougie treehouse. <laughs> like, some of you are ready to move in today. I understand. It might be available. Mason's heart loved a man he didn't even know. And the family said, absolutely. You know what they didn't say? I wonder if he'll steal our stuff. Yeah. 
I wonder if he'll invite more people, and then what are we going to do? Nope. You know what love does? Love assumes the best. They didn't care about their stuff. They cared about the man. They ended up moving him in the house. That's love. How are you doing with this? I, I'm not saying that's what you got to do. I'm just saying we can't even work with people. We're talking about them, gossiping. We're not loving them. Are you fighting for people? How about this church? We got so much drama in this church with people. I don't mean that ugly, but every, it's like everybody's going through something. We got health crisis. We got job problems. I mean, it, it, marriage problems, kid problems, parent problems. People are dying. Like, everybody's got issues. We got a big old drama-filled church. So how you doing? How you doing loving the church? Are you going over in the middle of the night? Surrounding the Stricklands on your hands and knees, praying over them, going to war. That's the testimony I got this last week. Going to battle, saying, you will not win, devil. That's love. That's sacrifice. Like, how are you doing loving other peoples? Because this is how people will know God. Too many of us are selfish. We're thinking right now about what is going to satisfy us in this afternoon. Love is sacrificial and, and it is forgiving. And look, I know you've heard a ton of sermons on forgiveness. But Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 says, You are never more like God than when you forgive your enemies. So go ahead and think right now the person that's hurt you the most. Go ahead. Don't look at them if, it's in, if they're in here. And I got some people who have really offended me, really hurt me and my family. They gossip. I got people sitting right here who've done it. So what am I supposed to do with that? I only do what Jesus did. I strive to imitate God. I should treat people who offend me the way that God has treated me that offended him. Forgiveness is, is the most God-like thing you can do. You don't even know what it's doing. Is Oh, I've forgiven them. I for yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it keeps coming up. It keeps coming out of your mouth. Keep talking about it. Talk, you're talking about your forgiveness. Like, you're not allowing God to heal you. Well, you don't know what they've done. That's, that's it. You don't even know, Chris. If that would have been done to you, listen, that person, that person that hurt you may never, never be worthy of your forgiveness. But Jesus is. Love is best measured by the ability to forgive. If you can't do it, then you are not walking in love. Because really, when we love someone, when we love someone, we're really loving Jesus. It's not about that person. Man, it's about you and Jesus. And are you being sanctified? Do you look more like Christ? This way, you've got to walk in love, church. Paul goes on, and he about, this is the good stuff. This is the PG-13 edition. If you got littles, this is your time. You can plop out if you want to. But I, I tell you, I think the controversial, toxic um, sin that's in this world should be taught in the church and not experienced in the world. So I'm going to prepare you for what most of you are already messing with. You ready? It's going to get good. Paul, in verse 3, says this. We're, we're supposed to love like Jesus, but here we go. Sexual immorality, all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let 
there be thanksgiving. If I'm going to look like God, if I'm going to be sanctified here on earth, if people are going to see Jesus in me that I say that I love, i got to live a pure life. Come on now. This is not where you get excited. This is where you get your toes stepped on. Not by the pastor, but by the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you right now, the, one of the biggest... Uh, I'm getting excited. One of the, I'm going to walk all over. I'm sorry, cameramen. One of the biggest problems in the world today is that sex drives the culture. And the way the world has portrayed sex is that it's selfish. Lean in, teenagers. Lean in, grandma and grandpa. I'm telling you right now, sex is everywhere. We got men and women in this room, adulterers. Breaks my heart. No judgment from me. Because your sin's no worse than my sin. But it's your sinner. Paul says, you want to look like Christ? Stop being immoral. You know what that means? Listen to me. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't you dare claim Christ and go off and go watch Netflix and chill. Like, don't do it. Don't go parking. How dare you? You just might as well slap God right in the face. Say, that one doesn't count for me. I, you forgave me. Really? Sex is a gift from God. It is not just physical. Too many people treat sex as just physical oneness. And that happens in the confines of marriage between one man and one woman. You consummate the marriage. And physically, you become one, and something happens because it's not just physically. It's emotionally, it's spiritually. Your name becomes one, your finances become one, your problems, your debt, everything becomes one. You become a part of that person for life. And when you have sex outside of marriage, you take what you say is, I want you with my body, but nothing else. Oh, I love them. Marry them. I'm not ready to commit. You already have. I know how boys are. So, young men... Who are dating and older men who are dating and want to be dating don't you dare take advantage and don't you dare give away don't you dare take you put guardrails up you put boundaries up living together before marriage try before you buy I get it you want to be right marriage takes faith before marriage and during marriage. Like how dare you take someone's oneness from them physically and leave the rest. That's why it hurts so bad because it's not just about the physical. Paul says not even a hint. Not even a hint. Well how far is too far? That's the question. Most people, when they ask that question, shows that they want nothing to do with the pure life. Now, if you, you go to your parents and say, I, I want to get this right, I don't want it, that's different. But if your initial thought is, well, can I do this? Can I touch? Can I kiss? Can I hug? 
that already shows that you have no desire for what God wants when it comes to dating, to marriage. Paul says, you want to look like God? Get this right. Not even a hint. Listen to me. Not even a hint. Get it off your social media. Get it out of your, of your iCloud, of your iTunes, of your music. Get it off the TV, mom and dad. Not even a hint. Anybody convicted besides me? Like, not even a hint. Live a pure life. Fellas, you want a woman to fall madly in love with you and stay with you and, and just be devoted to you? You serve her this way. You remain pure. You respect her, you respect you, and you respect the Lord. What if you've crossed the boundary? Hey, listen to me. Me too. Me too. I struggled. And this is part of my story. And I wouldn't wish it on anyone because there are consequences to what I've done. And you'll never know the hurt. Maybe I'll tell you sometime. But when you do things outside the beautiful gift of marriage, it robs. It robs you and it robs the other person. And there are scars. Some people are walking wounded from something that never should have happened. But I'm here to tell you, if God can, if God can redeem me and restore me and place me on a, on, a, on a place to pastor and serve and lead him, lead, lead others to him, and he can do it for you. You're not too far gone. You're not too far dirty. The blood of lamb cleans you. And it's not just about sex, by the way. Paul talks about it. He says, don't covet. Stop being greedy. This is the one nobody thinks is applicable to them. But all of us are. We're greedy. I've got to have this job. I've got to make this money in order to be successful, in order to be happy. I'm going to work my butt off until I get that promotion, until I get noticed, until I get on staff. I, I'm gonna, I, I have to lose 50 pounds, 20 pounds in order for me. So I concentrate. I focus. It's everything I do, everything. I, 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 I got to make sure my kids are involved in all this stuff. I've, I have to be, I got to get married. I got to be married. If I'm not married, then I don't even know what this life is for. This is all covetousness. It's the way that we covet. It's improper because it is insulting to God because you have placed good things. And everything I just mentioned are good things, but you've made them God. It's the reason you wake up. It's the reason you work. It's the reason you live. It's the reason. You've got to stop. Your life is for God, not good. This is the world today, isn't it? Like, this is just who we are. Which is no wonder why the world is so jacked up. And churches are so jacked up. And people don't want anything to do with God. It's because Christians don't look like God. We're out for us. We are so selfish. Some of you are going to sit here and be convicted, and you're going to do some things. You're going to block some things. Mom and dad, you're going to get some filters put on for your kids because you know they can't control it. Kids, you're going to unfriend and unfollow and block some things. And, you, you know, some of you are going to confess today and repent, and that's going to be great. But I'm afraid that there's going to be some people who it's just like, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I want. I heard it before. Okay, so hear this. Paul says... You better be sure of this. Everybody who's sexually immoral, you want to continue to date the way you are? Okay. And continue to live that way? Do what you want to do? Do married things before you're married? Okay. You want to continue to be addicted to porn? By the time a person graduates, they've had 14,000 experiences, references to pornography. Person. Not a boy. Not a, just a person. So, eh, it's, it's just part of the world. Okay. 
Paul says, everyone who is sexually immoral or impure in verse 5, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. None. None. Let nobody deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon you, or comes upon the sons of disobedience. Remember, Paul's talking to the church, like I'm preaching to you. And as you hear that, you're probably going, what? Am I not, what, I have no inheritance? Because I'm addicted? Or because I'm doing this? Evidently, in the church of Ephesus, people were thinking, we want God in our lives. We're saved. Thank you for Jesus. But I'm going to do what I want. And I'm going to live with who I want. And I'm going to get what I want. I love God, but I'm going to have my side chick. I love God, but I'm going to do my own thing. Like I'm saved, but I'm still living in sin. I want you to hear me very carefully. If you don't hear anything else right now, this is so important for you to hear. You cannot, you cannot become a follower of Jesus and continuing, continue practicing idolatry and pursuing sin. Listen very carefully. You cannot say, I gave my life to Christ on Sunday, and then Monday start going right back living the way you did, and nothing changed. It is impossible, Paul says. You've got no inheritance in the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about you struggle with sin. I'm not talking about your, your backslide or your fall. I'm talking about continually living in sin. I'm glad you prayed a prayer. I'm glad you raised your hand. I'm glad you believe. That's all great. But if you're not living differently, Paul says, you aren't saved. You got no inheritance. That means when you walk out this door, if you were to breathe your last breath, you would not be with God. And so Paul doesn't say, start coming to church, start living right, start doing this thing. Remember, he says your heart's got to be right because it's Jehovah Makedesh. The Lord is the one that sets you apart. He's talking about practicing sin, habitual sin. And the church has done a disservice to you. We said for you to come and accept Jesus like he's some guy begging for you to accept him. Jesus doesn't need to be accepted by you. You need to be forgiven by him. That's the bottom line. And you don't even know that you need forgiveness until you are aware of how sinful you really are. If you've never repented of your sin and turned from sin and to God and pursued him, Paul says, no inheritance for you. And you're not fooling God. You may be fooling your wife or your family or your pastor. You ain't fooling God. We must follow Jesus. We must take up our cross. Ephesians tells us to put off the old. Put on the new. Kill sin. Kill sin. Or it'll kill you. He goes on in verse 7 and says, Don't become partners with them. For at one time, you were darkness. You not were in darkness. You were darkness. And now you are the light in the Lord. If I'm going to look like God, if I'm going to be sanctified here on earth, I better shine my light. Walk as children of light. Verse 9, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. How many of you are shining your light today? How many of you are living in the light? You want to know how? How you know if you are? Light always looks to shine. Verse 10 says that. You're trying to please the Lord. You know, we're like the moon. Do you know how the moon gets its light? The moon reflects the sun that is no longer visible when it's dark. So listen, little lights, little Christians. We're living in a dark time, in a dark world. How bright are you shining? Because if you're not, 
you've got to ask yourself, am I light? Right? Hide it under a bushel? No. No. And, and not only do you let your light shine, but you expose darkness. Which means you've got to, oh, you got to hang out with unbelievers. You ain't got to do what they do. And you ain't got to go where they go. In fact, you probably don't even have to look that far. They might be in your house, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, at your coffee shop, at the gas station, at the restaurant, serving you food. Light always exposes darkness. And do you know that no amount of darkness can put out the light? None. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. Now, exposed does not mean going into the mall and having a sign that says, repent or you're going to hell. Let me ask you a question. Is that true? Yes. Yes. If you do not repent, you go to hell. But that's not what light does. When you expose people that are in the darkness, that means your light shines in a way that makes them question why you're doing and why you're saying and why you're living the way you do. I had a great discussion with our, some of our deacons last week. And you can speak truth, but it doesn't matter unless you're doing it in love. People don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And if I come at you and say, hey, girl, you need to be wearing some better clothes because it's just showing too much. And, and you bet, I don't even know if you're going to go to heaven. And I can't believe you look like that. Change right now. Man, that's not going to be received well. I got to speak truth in love. That's how I expose the darkness. Now, I don't even have to say anything. I can model, I can imitate what God looks like, how he talks, how he thinks to other people. That's the way I can expose people. And somebody goes, why do you do that? I pray with people all the time outside of this place. And sometimes they say, why did you do that? There's my, there's my chance. Let me just tell you why. And, and I'll tell them my story. Or I'll be generous to somebody just out of the blue. Why did you do that? Don't say, I just thought you could, I could help you. No, 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 no. Because Jesus was so generous to me. Do you know Jesus? Like, let your light shine. When you joke about sin, when you're stingy with your money, when you do sloppy, lazy work, when you lose your temper, when you're quick to just say whatever you want, when you're gossiping, when you come in God's house and worship halfway, do you know what you're doing? You're obscuring other people's vision of the light. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. People are attracted to light. Fourth of July, you are looking at what? The light, the fireworks. And you go, oh, we need some Christians today, some men and women to rise up and be the light in the darkness. And then finally he says in verse 15, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. If I'm going to be sanctified here on earth, I got I to gotta be wise and not foolish. I got to be wise. What's a fool? Don't call anybody a fool. But Psalm 14.1 tells us the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Proverbs 12.15 says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. A fool believes they're God, believes they're in control, believes they can solve everything, fix everything, believes that they know best. A fool lives how they want to live. Paul says, be wise. What is wisdom? It's living out God's word through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't be wise without the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, you can be smart, you can have a lot of knowledge, 
You may be able to solve some things, but you are not walking in wisdom if you're not seeking the power of the Spirit. How do you become wise? Walk with the wise. Hang out with wise people. Get in God's Word. Ask God. God, God's amazing. God says, hey, if you just ask me for wisdom, I'll give it to you, and I'll give you so much, you don't even know what to do with it. We need this wisdom. I just, more than anything this morning, I need you to answer this question. Do you look like God? That's it. Spouses, ask each other, how am I doing loving like Jesus in our home? How am I doing forgiving? How am I doing walking in wisdom? Like, how am I doing imitating God? Ask each other and listen and take it, receive it. How am I doing being pure? Now, when you preach a message like this, it's very strong. It wasn't a lot of ha-ha-ha moments or ha-ha funny. But I'm just telling you, this is what we need to do, church, to reach a lost world. For you, you know why this is so important? Because many, maybe most of the struggles you go through are self-induced. They just are. You can look back now and see that. Not all of them. But if we're not growing closer to God, don't, look, don't miss this. I, I've told this before. I like to go to the beach, and I like to um, just, you know, stand in the water about up to this high. And, you know, just out there, not doing nothing, just looking and, you know, my wife and my daughter might be on the, the beach laying out, whatever, and I'm, I'm in the ocean, and I'm just, you know, whatever, having there, or I'm just floating. The next thing I know, 10 minutes goes by, 20 minutes goes by, I turn around, they're not there. Now, did they leave me? That's my first thought. But then I look around. Oh, they're way over there. What happened? I didn't move. I drifted. I drifted away. I wasn't intentional about staying in front of them. And if you're not intentionally, intentionally staying in front of God, pursuing God, then you are slowly drifting away. That's what's happened to some of us. We didn't mean to get addicted to pornography. It just started with one look, one website, one follow. And now, it's not like we planned it, but we didn't plan not to. We've got to sanctify. We've got to become more like Christ. Not in heaven. We're, we're saved for those of us who have trusted Christ, positionally sanctified. But progressively on earth, we're drowning and we're drifting. We need to repent. We need to come back. Get out of the ocean of sin. Stand with your God. Pursue him. Hunger and thirst after the things that he loves. So... Let's take a moment. Let's just close our eyes. I'm going to do this with you. I'll look this way just so you know it. Let's just be still. And let's ask the question. God, show me 
where I don't look like you. Keep listening to God. Some of you, you aren't living a life of love. You're angry. Your face shows it. Your words tell it. You don't put others first. This world is meant for you, and that's the way you live. You're trying to pursue more, get more, spend more, have more, go more. Build your kingdom. You are not loving like Jesus. You're not sacrificing for people. You're not putting others first. If you do, it's just really to gain. Some of you aren't loving because you have unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment. You've got church hurt. You've got relational hurt, you've got parenting hurt, you've got home hurt, you got, you're just hurt. And there's no way you can walk in love because you haven't allowed the Lord to heal you. And that's why you don't look like God. You're not loving like Jesus. You don't even see people. Some of you. Some of you, let's just be real honest, you're not living in a pure light life. The things you're looking at, the things you're listening to, the inappropriate relationship you have, you've gone too far. You're going against God's word. You're living in darkness. You're pursuing sin because it's fun. And you, because you think it'll make you happy. But all it's brought is misery, pain, and hurt. And you don't know what to do. Because you don't look like God. Some of you are struggling being a light. You are so into yourself that you cannot tell one person about Jesus. You are so scared. Fear is gripping you. And the way you live is not even a light. Some of you need wisdom today. You make stupid decisions. You talk before you think you keep going back to the same things I'm just saying church do you look like God are you being sanctified can you look back over the last year of your life and say I'm closer to God now than ever or are you drifting The lights are going to dim and you're going to continue to seek and soak and the band's going to come. And I want to challenge you, for those of you who are saved, who are, listen, not for those of you who are thinking that you're saved, that you don't, you just know. I want to challenge you. Repent. Repent. Jesus' blood has declared it is finished. You are not too far. You are not too dirty. You have, the price has been paid. And for you to just choose sin over Christ is a slap in the face. Today's the day. Repent. Come back home. Stop drifting. And I want to ask one more question. Because I believe that there's some of you in this room. This is the first time you've heard this. You can't be sanctified. You can't be more like Christ if you don't know Christ. If you've never given him your life. I'm not saying play game. I'm not saying pray a prayer or walk an aisle. I'm saying you give your life total control over the Jesus Christ. You consecrate yourself so that he will sanctify you. How? The Bible says it very simply. That you are a sinner in need of saving. You are desperately lost. You're choosing sin. Not just that you choose sin, but you are sin. On your best day, you think you think sinful thoughts. You do sinful things. You say sinful things. We are sinners, and there's nothing we can do about it. But the good news is that God so loved you that he decided 
that he made the decision to choose you for just a time as right now. Because the payment of sin is death and separation. That means, listen, if you die without Christ, if you die in your sin, you will be lost forever. You will have no joy, no hope. You will be eternally separated from God for eternity. But God so loved you that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to walk this earth, to live this earth. This is not just a story. This actually happened. Jesus lived this life, and he did not sin, which made him the perfect sacrifice. And he was executed, murdered, beaten, hung on a cross. That was the payment. Why? He didn't do anything. That's right. (laughs) We did. See, he died for you. But the amazing thing is, three days later, he came back to life. He rose again to prove that he was the son of God. And the Bible says that if you repent and you believe and you call on the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation, you will be saved, redeemed, sanctified right now. That's for somebody today. In your heart, you know you're lost. You know that you do not have a relationship with God. And today, God says, come home and this is your day. What do I do? Repent and believe and confess that Jesus is Lord. And what I want you to do is when we start singing, I'm going to stand right here. You just come. You just put your arms around me and said, hey, I need Jesus. I'm lost and I need to be saved. That's it. So church, let's look a lot more like God from here on out. Father, this is your house and we are your people. We consecrate ourselves to you in this moment. In Jesus' name, let's stand. This altar's open. I'll be here to talk, to pray. You come. We got prayer team that'll be in place. Come on, move as God moves you. I'm excited about the days ahead, church. So Father, now as we go, we know that you go with us. Help us to look so much like you that it causes the world around us, that causes our coworkers, our neighbors, our family, and our friends, and even strangers to go, what is going on? I need what they have. I pray we leave here with the joy of the Lord. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen and amen. Church, you're sent.